it's so beautiful to see each person's spiritual growth and these two Torah portions that are normally combined into one are literally akre mo which means after death then holiness mm -hmm. holiness is the second one and that's the only way we come to holiness after we are willing to die to ourselves that's the new birth experience you had an awakening in 2008 and now every day we have to die daily just like Paul said so it's really indicative of not just your life but all of our lives and all of the process of sanctification after death holiness and may we die daily to the self that makes us think that we're separate from God that makes us seem disconnected and wanting to gratify the body and the flesh because we are spiritual beings having this physical experience but what has the enemy tricked you the, the true enemy is self and we're going to talk about it today he has tricked you into thinking that you are a physical entity having an occasional spiritual experience and that occasional spiritual experience feels like a little high yeah but why does it feel like a high because that's your true identity that you're tapping into and really it's just the opposite we are spiritual beings that need to be totally devoid of self just like our rabbi Yeshua exemplified the only way to holiness and to overcoming sin is to die to the self and that's what we're going to talk about this morning in Kodeshim, since this is a leap year, we are separating Kodeshim from Akre Mot, and we're able to focus more deeply into just this one Torah portion, which is only two chapters, Leviticus 19 and Leviticus 20. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. The word Kodeshim is a plural, representing God's people, because in this chapter, 19 verse 2 God tells Moshe to speak to the entire community of Israel and tell them you people are to be holy because I yod heh vav -He, your God am holy and if you read it in the Hebrew literally it would be holy you shall be for holy I am that would be the literal translation of it and it's Kodeshim this is the holy people you can see the im is like the apostrophe s it's the plural we have a few different words that come out of the root kadosh which is the word for holy in hebrew and i'm showing you some of the variations whether you add a vowel or a consonant it just changes it or tweaks it ever so slightly so kodeshim is holy people where kadusha with this hey on the end is holiness and what's interesting, if you looked at Hebrew as both a pictorial language and as a phonetic language, you would see little pictures come out, like this is the spine and this is a head. So this represents a person, which is kuf. This person is standing at the door. The dalit is the door. And the sheen represents the shekinah. So the way to holiness is to enter into the way of the Shekinah glory. This is what emanates out from God as light and love and life. And so literally we have to find what is the path for us back to holiness because we were created in holiness. God is holy and we're going to look at some aspects of holiness in God and the divine nature as an example for us the goal for us to strive for so we see certain things in God we see certain things in the scriptures that are leading us to remember what holiness looks like when you change this vav this vav is a connector and so you literally you have a person standing at the way connected to the Shekinah being revealed so now you have holiness being revealed Kadosh is the word for holy with this connector in it but the root word in Hebrew most Hebrew words have only a three consonant root so it would be kuf dalit shin and that is where we get also the word just by changing the vowel points to kiddish kiddish means to devote something or set it apart for only holy use like we have kiddish Friday night what are we doing we're separating the next 24 hours from sundown to sundown for holy use the holy Shabbat as commanded by God we are called to be a holy people set apart and we often think set apart from what that's the question 
If we're a set apart people, we're not going to be set apart from God because holiness is all about reconnecting to God. What could we say we are set apart from? Maybe our ungodly family or friends? The world, if you go deeper, that is apart from God, living a godless life. What about the underworld, even the demonic forces of darkness in the spiritual realm? We could all say that we're set apart from those, or when we sin, or when we're tempted, we might say, oh, well, this person influenced me, or the world influenced me on the television, or the devil made me do it, or the demonic forces, right? But what is the real enemy? This is what we're going to look at. The real enemy, if you go back to the very first origin, what tempted our family and friends to be apart from God? What tempted the world? What tempted the underworld, the demonic forces, to rebel against God? What tempted Lucifer in the very first temptation? Was it not this idea that I'm separate from God and I need to exalt myself? It's self-exaltation. So really, the true enemy is self. As we have learned in so many Torah portions, we want to be set apart from the self and reconnect to the source. This is the whole goal of holiness. In Leviticus chapter 19, God tells his people, I want you to be holy, for I am holy. You came from me. It's time to return back to what true holiness is. And he meets Israel where they're at in the wilderness with certain things that are going to help them understand holiness in different concepts. And I want you to, as we read this chapter, think, is this a person, a place, a thing? Like we used to say all nouns are either a person, place, or a thing. There's holiness in people, in places, in things, but also in time. I was thinking of different examples as Father was downloading this, this week. And also morality. In different areas, you know that he's talking to Israel. Israel, you're going to be unique. You're going to be a light to the world of what holiness looks like. Not because you're great, and not because you're holy, but because I made covenant with your grandfather, Abraham. And I'm going to keep my covenant, and you are going to learn holiness so that you can be a light to the nations everywhere that you're scattered and you'll become a numerous people so you'll be scattered to the four corners of the earth so that everyone will have an opportunity to see what holiness is and this is what first corinthians was talking about when it says god was reconciling the whole world to himself through yeshua where israel failed in being a perfect light of holiness yeshua came on the scene and showed us what true holiness really looks like so you have both Israel and the descendants of Israel are meant to be a holy people, but also Yeshua. How about places? We know throughout the scriptures, God says, take off your sandals, for this is holy ground. Even when we go up on the Temple Mount, we recognize this was a place where the Shekinah once dwelled, and a lot of rabbis take off their shoes. They want to walk in holiness before the Lord. There's holiness in things such as the temple vessels or Torah scroll is considered holy. We treat it with respect. We give it its own special dwelling place in the ark, in the, uh, in the synagogues. We know Shabbat and the Moedim are holy periods of time. So there's holiness in time. There's holiness in morality with laws that emphasize selfless acts towards our fellow man in our human relations or there's certain laws that help us avoid self-seeking and doing things just for the self but what is the common denominator in all of these different aspects of holiness and we'll look at more as we read through chapter 19 if you think about it each one of these aspects is something set apart Israel could be doing its own thing it needs to be devoid of self to truly reflect God's light and holiness it needs to be devoid of self. This ground, which is normally used for growing anything it wants, is now being set apart for God to dwell, and it is sacrificing its own uh, purpose, or original purpose, or its um, own desire, if you will, 
the temple vessels, they're all vessels. They all look the same as your cooking vessels. But what's the difference? They're set apart. Now they're not going to be used for common use. And that's like us. We're no longer to be considered common. There's this issue of sacred versus profane. Are we going to be sacred? Or are we going to be something that's just common and that can be thrown away? Shabbat is just another day of the week, right? Many people work on this day of the week. But God says, set it apart for only holy use. Don't think your own thoughts. Don't speak your own words in Isaiah 58. So Shabbat, in a sense, even the day had to sacrifice itself to be used for holy purpose. And the same with the seven annual holy days throughout the year. And so on with the laws of morality for us. So as we read this chapter, let's think about these different areas and how they reflect to selflessness. Adonai said to Moshe, speak to the entire community of Israel and tell them, you people are to be holy because I, Adonai your God, am holy. Every one of you is to revere his father and mother. This is the very first aspect of holiness that God introduces. What is it about honoring our father and mother? This word revere is like even taking honor to the next level. God's always moving us to the next level in our walk of sanctification, as you were saying. We know that life comes from the father and the mother. And I've taught before about the deeper principle of the Heavenly Father living in accordance with His principles and the Earthly Mother. We need to take care of the Earth because this is where our vessels come from. Just like the womb of a woman is where the seed of a man gets placed into, the Spirit of God got placed into the womb of this Earth. So we have a responsibility to honor and revere Earthly Mother and Heavenly Father. When we do this, we're setting aside our own selfish agenda. We could misuse the resources of the earth. We could cut down all of the trees so that we could build a huge monument to ourselves, only to find out that we've now suffocated ourselves and all of our carbon dioxide is not going to be changed back into oxygen through these beautiful trees that God has created with a purpose. When we act unselfishly, we only use what we need to sustain life, but we never overuse or misuse resources. So you could see this general principle of honoring father and mother all of a sudden having this huge implication of selflessness and responsibility in taking care of what God's entrusted us to have dominion over, which means to take care of, to tend. He says, and <coughs> you are to keep my Sabbaths. Well, interesting, this is the fifth and the fourth commandment immediately addressed in our walk of holiness. So two things that set us apart. Honoring father and mother and honoring Sabbath. The interesting thing about honoring Sabbath is it is set apart for holy use. And when we enter into covenant with God and we start setting Shabbat apart, we start that process of true sanctification, which is the path to holiness. We get set apart as God's holy people. This is why this is the only thing in the scriptures that he says three times, this is my sign between me and my people, those that keep my Shabbats. Because without Shabbat, we will not be sanctified. This is how important Shabbat is. And so it's listed in the very beginning as the foundation for our path towards holiness. He says, Do not turn to idols, and do not cast metal gods for yourself. I am yod heh vav -Heh, your Elohim. What is the issue of idols? When we put anything in the place of God, we are then deluding ourselves as to our source. And... What most people use idols for is for praying for something self-seeking, like power, better job, more money, uh, beautiful wife. Everything that a person normally prays for before they start this higher consciousness is self-seeking. 
And God wants us to keep our focus on Him and not on a gold idol because God is not flashy. God is not self-seeking. Even His name starts with the smallest of all the Hebrew letters. He's selfless. He's meek. He's humble. He wants us to stay focused on Him, not on a substitute. Because in looking at a substitute, we are prone to more self-seeking. And the whole process of holiness is getting rid of or being set apart from that self, that ego. Yes, Victor. I will cast the shadow upon the light of God. Yes. In James it says, Yep. Our Father is the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or even a shifting shadow. But when you put an image of anything that's been created in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or the waters underneath the earth, you're casting a shadow, something that's less than that perfect holiness in God who is spirit. And this is why we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. He says, when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai, offer it in a way that will make you accepted. It's very interesting. It is to be eaten the same day you offer it and the following day. But if any of it remains until the third day, it is to be burned up completely. And we have spoken in the past about the principle of the third day. You know, in Peter, it says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And if Yeshua, who is the perfect example of holiness for God's people, makes an atoning sacrifice, it lasts for how long before sin is not meant to be committed anymore? There's no longer a sacrifice for sin. We know sin would go through 1,000 years after him. 2,000 years. Here we're at the end of the 2,000 years, right? The Messianic age will begin at the third symbolic day, and that's when Torah is being written upon our heart so that by the end of it, sin and death can be thrown into the lake of fire. They can be eradicated. So here, even in the sacrifices, it's hinted at that a sacrifice is only going to remain until the third day. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it will become a disgusting thing. That's like sinning right in front of the living Torah. Imagine he's teaching Torah from Jerusalem and you choose to hold on to the self and the ego and be separate from God and indulge the self and self-exalt yourself. And imagine... All sin has its origin in self-seeking of some sort or another. And this is why sin is self-destructive. All self-seeking is self-destructive. So it will become a disgusting thing. Imagine in the Millennial Kingdom, choosing to sin when you've got the perfect example of holiness in front of you. Would this also be practical that after the third day, the week might be going bad and so it's for your benefit? Absolutely. God is protecting you with this law. In Torah, there's always the physical application and the spiritual application. The physical application is very obvious and then as we grow spiritually we start to see that behind in the spiritual realm there's something much deeper that it's hinting at and it's not at first seen and that's called the sowed of the word. Absolutely. There's always a physical application as well as a spiritual application. It says in verse 8, Moreover, anyone who eats it will bear the consequences of profaning something holy meant for Adonai. So Yeshua had a purpose in being the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so that we could have life extended. Otherwise, the wages of sin is immediate death. So the whole purpose of this sacrifice is to extend our lives so that we can learn and through the freedom of choice come back to the Father of our own free will and enter into this walk of holiness to be recreated in His image. Imagine if anyone eats of it after the third day, after its intended time period, he will bear the consequences of profaning something holy meant for Adonai, and that person will be cut off from his people. And we know that there is a process after the millennial age that there's another judgment. And that's when people will truly be cut off that hold on to sin and darkness in their life. So this is hinting at so much more. When you harvest the ripe crops produced in your land, don't harvest all the way to the corners of your field, and don't gather the ears of grain left by the harvesters. Now what would this have to do with holiness? 
Now it's going into agriculture. And we talked about how holiness can relate to people, places, things. So this would be a place. And what is the purpose of this? To feed people. Exactly. To help us through the laws that encourage our selflessness in our human relations, realizing that God's Spirit is in each and every one. And we need to take care of each person. And in so doing, he says, it's like you're taking care of me. So even in the land, he's getting us to think outside of our natural selfish nature and starting to realize that our walk of holiness relates to every aspect of our life, even our work, even our jobs, even our time, even our relationships. He says, likewise, don't gather the grapes left on the vine or that have fallen on the ground after harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners. I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God. Do not steal from, defraud, or lie to each other. Once again, why do people do that? It's because they're trying to gain something for themselves. Do not swear by my name falsely, which would be profaning the name of your God. So God's name is holy. This is another aspect of holiness I could have written down here, but I put it up here in qualities inherent in God. His name is holy. Now if you keep your finger there and move with me over to Ezekiel, we'll read about the holiness of God's name. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23. Tell the house of Israel that Adonai Elohim says this, I am not going to do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have been profaning amongst the nations where you went. But I'm going to set apart my great name to be regarded as holy. So his name is set apart for only holy use. This is why we don't use it in common language. And what does he say about the nations? I'm going to set it apart since it has been profaned in the nations and you profaned it among them. The nations will then know, once his name has been set apart for only holy use, that I am yod heh vav -Heh. When before their eyes, how will they know his name is holy and he is holy? When before their very eyes, he's set apart through you to be regarded as holy. So how will the nations know God's holiness and the holiness of his name? Through you. And a name is indicative of character. So this means if we understand God's name, we will understand something about his character and by beholding we will become changed into that same likeness it will change us and then we can be a better light to the nations so if we put God's name here you have Yod He Vav He and up till a few hundred years ago, in the Torah, there was never any vowel points. So you had to know or be orally taught from your father or your rabbi how to pronounce that name. And if you don't add anything to it from the Masoretic text or any other vowel points, like many people have added through the years other vowels, like the vowels from Adonai, the vowels from Elohi, to keep you from profaning God's name, if you just said it the way it is, you would hear different attributes of God's character. Yahava. In Yahava, you hear Hava, which means source of life. You hear Ahava, which is love. And you hear Av, which is father. So you literally have the Father, which is the source of life and the source of love, hidden in His name. When you truly honor your Father, as the very first instruction to holiness commands us, you will, by beholding, become changed into that same likeness of love, realizing that selfless love, love is always selfless by nature, it's always other-centered, it's always wanting to give, it's wanting to take care. We will start to emulate that, and that 
will reveal to the nations the holiness of God and his name. In understanding his name, it's beautiful. He wants the nations to know that he is holy and he's going to show the nations his holiness through us being set apart as his people. So it's so important. Coming back to Leviticus 19, verse 12, he says, Do not swear by my name falsely, which would be profaning the name of your God. I am yod heh vav -Heh. Do not oppress or rob your neighbor. Specifically, you are not to keep back the wages of a hired worker all night until morning. Once again, an aspect of selfishness or selflessness. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 14, it says, Do not speak a curse against a deaf person or place an obstacle in the way of a blind person. Rather, fear your God. I am yod heh vav -Heh. This is the sixth time that he's established his name. I am yod heh vav -Heh. Do not be unjust in judging. Neither show partiality to the poor nor deference to the mighty. With justice, judge your neighbor. Do not go around spreading slander among your people. But also don't stand idly by when your neighbor's life is at stake. The seventh time, I am yod heh vav -Heh. Do not hate your brother in your heart, but rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you won't carry sin because of him. So when somebody does something wrong, whether to you or to God, we don't want to gossip about them. We don't want to slander them. We don't want to be angry in our heart. But what does God command us to do to save that person? Go and speak to him, frankly, because his life is hanging in the balance. When he is committing a sin that either is unknown or willing, he is putting himself in the enemy's domain for judgment. God wants to protect, wants to save. So he encourages us to be a participant in that salvation as well by speaking with love the issue at hand because he says the neighbor's life is at stake. He says, don't take vengeance on or bear a grudge against any of your people. Rather, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second greatest commandment, secondary only to loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. And so it's right here in this Torah portion, Kodeshim, about holiness, that we get one of the greatest commandments given reflecting selflessness, which is to love others the way you love yourself. If you do that, there's no self-seeking in that. It eliminates the self, and that's why it's so powerful. And this is what has been known through the ages as the two greatest commandments. The Shema, which is all about giving your life to God and heart, mind, and soul. Remember the three levels of soul that we talked about last week? That means with every level of your soul, giving it to God. And when you do that, it's going to be natural for you to love your fellow man as yourself. And then he says, the eighth time, I am yod heh vav -Heh. Observe my regulations. Don't let your livestock mate with those of another kind. Don't sow your field with two different kinds of grain. Don't wear a garment of cloth made with two different kinds of thread. So God is talking about mixture. Just like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mixture is so subtle when you can't tell one thing from the other. God has created every species and every plant perfect in its own way. He's relating to a principle of no mixture of good mixed with evil, light mixed with darkness in this. Then verse 20 goes into relationships. If a man has a relationship with a woman who is a slave intended for another man, and she has neither been redeemed nor given her freedom, there is to be an investigation. They are not to be put to death because she was not free. In reparation, he is to bring a ram as a guilt offering for himself to the entrance of the tent of meeting. The Kohen will make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before Adonai for the sin he committed, and he will be forgiven for the sin he committed. <coughs> when you enter the land and plant various kinds of fruit trees, you are to regard its fruit as forbidden. 
Once again, the selfish nature would say, this is produced fruit the very first year. I'm going to take it for myself. But God who created the tree understands that it's better for that tree to not have fruit plucked from it for the first three years. And so we have to exhibit self-control by watching this tree produce fruit and then it hang on the limbs until it goes bad and then it drops its seed into the ground. But the tree is getting stronger. And so if by faith we observe some of these laws that are called hoax, these hoax are not logical, not necessarily understood at first glance, but God understands it's for the good of all life. We will be blessed if we can set apart our selfish nature and follow his laws by faith. He says, For three years it will be forbidden to you and not to be eaten. In the fourth year all its fruit will be holy. So it's set aside for praising Adonai. But in the fifth year you may eat of its fruits so that you will produce, so it will produce even more for you. Now imagine if we operated that way. You're showing respect for the life of the tree, first and foremost, and for its offspring. Then when you finally do pluck in the fourth year its fruit, you're glorifying God who created it, and you're putting yourself last in the fifth year. All of these principles are teaching selflessness. Do not eat anything with blood. And we talked about this in great length last week. Why? Do not practice divination or fortune telling. Don't round your hair at the temples or mar the edges of your beard. Don't cut gashes in your flesh when someone dies or tattoo yourself. I am Adonai. Do not debase your daughter by making her a prostitute so that the land will not fall into prostitution and become full of shame. Keep my Shabbats and revere my sanctuary. So here we've got sanctuary as a kind of a place and a thing and Shabbat time all in one short mitzvah. I am Adonai. Do not turn spirit mediums, don't turn to them or sorcerers, don't seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Adonai, your God. Why do people turn to spirit mediums? They want to know the future. They want to gain an advantage for themselves. Why do they not want to revere the Shabbat? They want to do their own will on his holy day. Why would they not revere his sanctuary? It's full of gold. Somebody might come through and if they didn't recognize it to be holy, pilfer one of the vessels for their own selfish gain. All of these things he's teaching us, there's certain things that are set apart in holiness. Now after we go through these chapters, we're going to look a little bit more deeper at some of these aspects of holiness, such as purity in the divine source, selflessness, and Torah observance for us. And this aspect of loving each other. We're going to look at some of what the first century rabbis were relating to these passages about holiness. Verse 32 says, Stand up in the presence of a person with gray hair. Show respect for the old. You are to fear your God. I am Adonai. Did you hear that, young people? Shekinah? When somebody with gray hair comes before you, you stand up out of respect. If we did that, how much more would people stand up out of respect when we say a blessing or a prayer or we're singing a, a praise to God? We're not doing these things for ourselves. We're doing them to glorify God. We should show honor and respect in every aspect of life. When you show respect to others, what are you doing to yourself? You're learning humbleness, meekness, selflessness. So these are beautiful traits that we should be teaching our children and be encouraging, not just on one time a year when we read this Torah portion, but throughout the year. And you know the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. We have to be helping each other with our children to remember, hey, if you see that we're praying and the child hasn't stood up, out of respect for God, encourage them to stand up. Or if there's a person that's older than them that needs a seat, they should offer, stand up and offer their seat. In this way, through habit, 
their lives and their characters will be changed moving towards holiness. Otherwise, if they're just watching TV and all the self-gratification that comes on YouTube and these different video games and apps and everything, what are our children going to be in a few years but following the ways of the world, self-seeking? So in these little ways, it's actually a blessing to teach our children. They might say, oh, that sounds so burdensome, or oh, why do that? But it's actually for their good. It's going to develop them. If a foreigner stays with you in your land, do not do him wrong. Rather, treat the foreigner staying with you like the native born among you. Do you know when we have a stranger staying in our house, if we only have one pillow, we give it to them. If we have a softer pillow than another, we give them the best pillow, the best blankets. We want to treat our foreigners even better than we treat ourselves. It says you're to love him as yourself, for you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God. He keeps reminding, be holy because I'm holy. This is my way. My selfless love would do this. And so I want to share with you how it looks in your lives. This is 3,000 years ago, right? If he spoke to us today, what would some of the things be that he would tell us to do that would be humble and meek and kind and giving and selfless? It would relate to the things that we are thinking we're okay in, but maybe we're holding back a little bit in selfishness. He wants us to let go of all for him. He says, don't be dishonest when measuring lengths, weights, or capacity. So this could relate to any aspect of our business or dealings in selling something. Rather, use an honest balance scale, honest weights, an honest bushel, dry measure, an honest gallon, liquid measure. I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Observe all my regulations and rulings and do them. I am yod heh vav -Heh. So doing these mitzvot are going to lead us on the path of holiness. And without them, we will not be led on the path of holiness. In Leviticus 20, that which we're about to read, if you skip ahead a little bit, you will see that he says it again at the end of that chapter as well. Verse 22 says, You are to observe all my regulations and rulings and act on them, so that the land to which I am bringing you will not vomit you out. Do not live by the regulations of the nations which I am expelling ahead of you. We don't want to copy the world. We want to follow God's ways of holiness. And so he constantly is telling us, do my mitzvot, do my laws, my statutes, my ordinances. This will be bringing blessings to you and to the land and bring you closer to me in holiness. At the beginning of chapter 20, he says to Moshe, say to the people of Israel, if someone from the people of Israel or one of the foreigners living in the land sacrifices one of his children to Molech, he must be put to death. The people of the land are to stone him to death. Now this is the origin of Molech was the male god, Ishtar was the female god. They would sacrifice these babies to this false god, believing that they need to appease the wrath of an angry god. And this is the deception that's been perpetrated on the minds of men for thousands of years, that God is harsh, judgmental, punishing, quick to judge. and. These false gods would perpetuate this false idea. So they would sacrifice their babies thinking that then they'll have better crops. This is what the pagans used to do. They'd have more blessings. Then they would take the blood of those babies and make a sacrifice to the fertility goddess, Ishtar, which Easter becomes named after. And the symbol of fertility is the egg. So they would dip the egg in the red blood of the babies. And you know, the Christian churches are perpetuating this horrible, what would you call it, ritual under the name of, and, it's, and they're substituting the Pesach lamb and the beautiful blood covering that we're to be under for this practice of Molech and fertility worship and child sacrifice. And if only people knew the origin of what these things come from, they have nothing to do with the God of Israel or anything to do with the Bible. 
It's out of ignorance that they're just following what they've been taught by their pastors and by their parents. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. God wants us to have nothing to do with the false gods of the Canaanites. So we should be able to stand up, just like that verse says in uh, the last chapter, Verse 17, it says, Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you won't carry sin because of him. There is a time to stand up and to speak the truth in love and to say, Brother, I know you don't mean to do it for this reason and it doesn't mean this to you, but look at its origin. Do you want anything to do with its origin in paganism? Child sacrifice? So there, we can stand up and we can share the truth in love. Yes? I found that when I would approach some people, they they understand and they realize that that's probably true, but they're not willing to make the separation. And that's what holiness is all about, making that separation, not just with the other people who are doing it in your family, but you have to deny yourself. Because it might have been a habit. It might have had fond memories like Christmas associated with it. You ultimately have to die to self to start following God's ways and leaving the old ways behind. Very good point. Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, I've had a walk, this walk alone all the time because of the fact that they're not willing to admit change, want to change. Mm -hmm. And there's stuff in the traditions of men. And uh, it's, it's sad, but all, you, all I found is uh, all I can do is pray for them and, uh, and love them where they're at mm -hmm. and try to be a light. And hopefully one day they'll come that's right. Once you've planted the seed, you don't need to harp on it. You just be the example. That's the way. People can easily tell the difference between a loving comment and something where you're speaking judgmentally, pointing the finger, putting them down. God never desires that we make somebody feel put down or where they lose their dignity. We always want to speak in a way that we're building them up, encouraging them, and assuming, I know you wouldn't want to do this, brother or sister, and you speak to them in a very respectful, honoring way. Verse 4 of chapter 20. That What's that? Sometimes we're called to have others speak that for us. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. This week, she invited me to speak on a forum about um, divination. And so I made a loving comment, but also showed scripturally all the areas that God forbids it. And... <laughs> Oh, that's okay. That was nice of you to... Otherwise, I normally don't engage in those kind of, you know, things. But um, since you asked, I was happy to share. I knew that I knew you could do it in love because that moment, I just, I knew I couldn't do it. It's <laughs> loving this. They might have needed. Oh, thank you. Yes, Ava. Yeah, when I went to my And so, then I said, how am I going to do that, you know? Because I cannot go, you know, and publicly aggravate people. People, they get angry. They can kill you. Because they are the influence in Calvary. All right. Here in the United States, the position of the Protestant is, is more, more fluid. People, they following by, by influence, celebrate Christmas, Another tradition is the pagan, you know, from the White House, which is adopted by the Catholic people there. And so it is many years that it's influenced people because before this country, they didn't celebrate Christmas. Right. Until, you know, later on. I don't know which year, I don't want to give you the, 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 the wrong date. But in this country, receive a lot of blessings because it's the paganist. But in Latin America, from Spain, it is hard. So when I went to the taxis, cars, you know, I start talking to the people, you know, so by voice people, they keep passing on. Uh -huh. you know. Plant those seeds. And yeah, so then when I saw the prophet, prophet said, the, you know, the statue, they care, uh -huh. put a lot of flowers, you know, so it's not size. 
that they crawled, you know, they put it on top of that altar when they carry it. <coughs> have the clothes of the German mixing with the Jewish. Yeah. You know, it is really, I said, this is a family. Mm -hmm. But I said, I wish that I can tell and tell them what they do, and that is a very offensive, you know, for the people doing yeah. That also takes self-control, doesn't it? Because sometimes we rise up with righteous indignation, and we want to shout out, but we have to make sure it's the Spirit leading us to speak in due season. It's so sad, you know, when people, and people, rich people, mm -hmm. you know, they bought, uh, they bought, you know, especially one of the, uh, things right here, they carry it, you know, they put it in the chest, and they pay $200, $300. <laughs> and people, they're rich and they think they're there, they're not ignorant, and when they are ignorant, and you know... Once again, they're old they're habits. Catholic. They're proud of their Catholics, I said, right, yeah, right, they're Catholic. <laughs> what kind of Catholic they are? And it just made me angry. Sometimes I used to be like that, and I was grew up in ignorance. When I came to this country, I said, my father wanted just to go to the church, the right church. And always was my prayer, you know. And later on, I found the Seventh-day Adventists where they start keeping the Shabbat. But later on, you know, that there was a lot of, you know, Ecumenic yep. system infiltrated into the old church. It's like the path of holiness. It's a step-by-step -step process. And God is leading us out of the old mindset and the old religious system and the old rituals and the old habits and traditions that come along with it. And little by little, if you can look back, I'm sure everybody can relate in your life how far you've come from the way that you were raised. And that's what God wants us to realize is that sanctification, which is the word that comes from Kadosh is the work of a lifetime, as Bob said earlier. It is not an overnight miracle. Like, we might have a born again experience where you realize I need to be totally dead to myself. I want to live as a living sacrifice. But then you trip and fall and you get back up and you ask for forgiveness and it's over and over and over. Little by little, if you keep your focus on the Father, you will look back and you'll say, you know, when did that change? Or when did that leave? Because he's been developing you. And it, he gets all the glory for that. If we focus on ourselves, that principle still applies. By beholding, you become changed into that same likeness. As much as people want to change, have you ever seen somebody that just cannot seem to kick a certain habit because they're focused on it? They only become more like that ugly habit that they despise. And then the guilt creeps in and the self-condemnation. And that just separates them from God. God says, just keep your eyes on me. And then that process of holiness will happen over a period of time. In verse 4, it says, If the people of the land look the other way when a man sacrifices his child to Molech and fails to put him to death, then I will set myself against him, his family, and everyone who follows him to go fornicating after Molech and cut them off from their people. The person who turns to spirit mediums and sorcerers to go fornicating after them, I will set myself against him and cut them off from their people. Therefore, consecrate yourselves... You, people, must be holy because I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God. Observe my regulations and obey them. I am yod heh vav -Heh, who sets you apart to be holy. Now we've always thought of being set apart from the world like we talked about earlier. But how many times do we really think about being set apart from the selfish nature, the lower self, the ego that wants to indulge itself, gratify itself, do things for itself? This is the real enemy. This is the enemy that caused the first sin even in the heavenly sphere with Lucifer. So we have to be aware all the time, and I always teach children this, every question can be boiled down to two simple alternatives. Is it selfish, self-seeking, or is it selfless? Then you'll know what is the right path. A person who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Having cursed his father or his mother, his blood is on him. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, that is, with the wife of a fellow countryman, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. The man who goes to bed with his father's wife has disgraced his father sexually, and both of them must be put to death. Their blood is on them. 
a man goes to bed with his daughter-in-law, both of them must be put to death. They have committed a perversion, and their lifeblood is on him. He's showing Israel, now you are my Kodeshim. You're my holy people. You can no longer engage in these practices, these thoughtless practices of the Canaanite heathens around you. You're to be set apart, and it's serious business to be set apart people. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is depravity. They are to be put to death by fire, both he and they, so that they will not deprave you. If a man has relations with an animal, he must be put to death, and you are to kill the animal as well. If a woman approaches an animal and has relations with it, the woman and the animal are to die. Their blood will be on them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and has relations with her, and she consents, it is a shameful thing. They are to be cut off publicly. So here he's relating to issues of morality now. With people, we're either going to be engaging in selfless human relations, or we have to learn, if we're that ignorant, to not know already how to avoid those issues of self-seeking that hurt our fellow man. Verse 22 says, You are to observe all my regulations and rulings and act on them so that the land to which I am bringing you will not vomit you out. And this applies just as much today as it did back then. He's coming to take us back to the promised land. If we don't start learning Torah now, like some people will say, well, I'll let him teach me when he comes if he wants to reintroduce Torah to my life. That shouldn't be our attitude because the land will spew us out if we are doing these abominable practices of the heathens. So he says, observe all my regulations and rulings and act on them so that the land will not vomit you out. Do not live by the regulations of the nations which I am expelling ahead of you because they did all these things, which is why I detested them. But to you I have said, you will inherit their land. I will give it to you as a possession, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God, who has set you apart from other people. This word, whenever you read set apart, it means to be made holy. Therefore you are to distinguish, because you're a holy set apart people, distinguish between what things are clean and unclean. Whether in animals or birds, don't make yourself detestable with an animal, bird, or reptile that I have set apart for you to regard as unclean. Rather, you, as my people, are to be holy for me, because I, Adonai, am holy. And I have set you apart from the other people so that you can belong to me. Now, if he is selfless love, he's setting us apart to be a reflection of himself on this earth in selfless love. So he's saying you have to be set apart because I've set you apart in covenant to be in relationship with me and to be a light to the nations. So in some of these areas, let's look in closing at these different aspects of holiness that we see inherent in the divine source as well as things for us. In 2 Corinthians 7.11, Paul describes beautiful this aspect of holiness. <coughs> Verse 11 says, What's that? See what this godly sorrow produces in you. Hmm. Was it 1 Corinthians 7.11 or was no, it? I'm sorry, it was in 2 Corinthians 7. <laughs> uh huh. That's okay. That's what I had written on there. But let me see if uh, maybe I did that erroneously. Nope. It must be 2 Corinthians. Unless I wrote down the wrong text. For just look at what handling the pain God's way produced in you. What earnest diligence, what eagerness to clear yourselves 
what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what readiness to put things right. In everything, you have proved yourself blameless in the matter. You know, I think, yeah. I think it's first one. First one. Seven one. That fits. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I just had an extra one on there. <laughs> Simple enough. Therefore, my dear friends, since we have these promises, let us purify ourselves from everything that can defile either body or spirit. This is so important because just like the old saying is, you are what you eat, what you do to your body is going to affect your spiritual walk. And what you do in the spiritual realm is going to affect your physical walk. This is why the power of thinking is so important because it is a spiritual principle that affects, we were created in the image of God, we think and speak things into existence, and it affects our physical health. And vice versa, if you're eating something unclean, when you're set apart as holy for God, what is that going to do? It's going to affect you both physically and spiritually. He says, strive to be completely holy out of reverence for God. So in thought, in body, in mind, body, and in spirit, in every aspect, ask yourself, is it self-seeking? Is it something that's going to separate me from God? Is it something that He has forbidden in His Word? Or is it something that's going to draw me closer to Him? What was Yeshua's example is another good way to remind yourself. He lived a life of fasting and prayer, not a life of extravagance. I was telling the kids the other night, He didn't even buy multiple clothing for himself. He didn't buy a house. What was his job? He fasted and prayed so that he could go with more power, healing more people and exemplifying how to live as a living Torah for Israel to follow that example. Let's see. What's that? Oh. Okay, uh, no, write that, write that down and then I'll answer as we finish up. Let's look at Romans 12, 1, about selflessness. This is the essence of God's nature. In the lower self, because we're in this vessel, we have the tendency to think that we are doing our own thing, that we're separate from God, that we need to take care of ourselves, that we need to, and when I say take care of ourselves, I don't mean, there is a good, healthy way to take care of yourself, but I mean doing everything indulgently for yourself. The more we can tap into the idea that there is nothing apart from God, that he, our consciousness that we have is His consciousness that's been given, the life that I have is His spirit, His ruach of life in me, then we will reconnect with doing everything in accordance with His will. Romans 12, 1 says, I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. So this means we have to die to the desire to gratify the self in order to reconnect with God. He says here the same word, kadosh, for God. You are set apart, living and set apart for God. So whatever we do should be for His glory, not for business as usual, because time is short. These are the th words that are often inconvenient truths. People don't really want to hear, what do you mean I can't do my own pleasure? Nobody really wants to sacrifice their life because why? They've become attached to it and they think that this life is all they have. But if you realize this life is like a fleeting blade of grass that blooms today and gone tomorrow, the spiritual life is what we want to feed and that we walk into eternity with. And so to do that, we have to first die to self. It's almost like a testing ground here. Are we worthy to be vessels for His service? The only way to do that is if we will die to the fleshy desires and live a life of holiness and self-denial the way Yeshua taught us. First Peter says, in everything that you do, do it in holiness. Let's look at First Peter 
115 in closing. He says, as people who obey God, do not let yourself be shaped by the evil desires you used to have when you were still ignorant. See, when you were operating in the flesh, you had these desires to gratify the flesh. On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in your entire way of life, in everything that you do. Since the Tanakh says, you are to be holy, because I am holy. Peter is quoting today's Torah portion. And he's saying, don't operate in the old mindset thinking you're separate from God. In everything that you do, follow the Holy One and become holy yourselves in your entire walk of life. That sums it up in a nutshell. That's our whole goal. And that's why we're here together encouraging one another on this walk of holiness. So if you want to join me in that walk of holiness, please stand and let's ask God to empower us with the strength to deny the flesh, to deny the self, and to reconnect with Him as a set-apart people in holiness. Abba, Father, we love you and we thank you for revealing your true nature is selfless love. And we have been deceived by thinking that we are separate from you and that we need to live lives gratifying ourselves, that we have this desire to do our own will instead of your will. But you have reminded us that we are a set-apart people, that you made covenant with our forefathers, that you would make us not only a kingdom of priests, but a bride without spot or blemish for your son. And so we thank you, Father, for encouraging us on this walk of holiness to be truly set apart, not just from the world, but from our own selfish nature that is in opposition with your nature of selfless love. We ask for your Ruach HaKodesh to live in us and through us, to empower us to live this out, Father, to walk meekly and humbly, to seek the goodwill of others above even our own self, to live out your laws of love in joy and with fervor, because this is truly the path to eternal life. It's not just about a head knowledge. It is about applying your selfless love to every aspect of our life, and in so doing, being made holy once again. We love you and we thank you for this. And we thank you for bringing us together as truth seekers, as called out believers to encourage each other on this path. And so I ask your blessings upon each and every one here. May we build each other up and edify the body, not just here, but around the world for your glory. In your holy name we pray. Amen.